Luke chapter 3, I don't really have an introduction tonight because uh, we know Luke 2 really well. So let's go to Luke chapter 3, starting with verse 1. Now in the 15th year of the reign of Caesar Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod the Tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip Tetrarch of the region of Etraea and Trachonitis, Lysianus, the Tetrarch of Abilene, and Annas and Caiaphas, high priests. A message from God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. I love how straightforward the Bible is. It doesn't try to convince you that it's true. It just gives you the facts, and you deal with the facts all you want. He just says it straightforward. He gives us a beautiful timeline of the time of Jesus and the time of John the Baptist. What we have here, we have seven different people. One of them, we don't have any archaeological evidence, no history of him at all, um, the one from Abilene. But everybody else, we have a perfect timeline, and Jesus sits right in the middle of it. So Tiberius Caesar ruled from 14 A.D. to 37 A.D., and I've got them color-coded, by the way, um, for you that aren't colorblind. <laughs> oh, the second one is Pontius Pilate, and he went from 26 A.D. to 36 A.D., so only 10 years. Herod Antipas went from 4 B.C. to 39 A.D., and his brother Philip went from 4 B.C. to 34 A.D., uh, Annas was the high priest from 615, 6 AD to 15 AD, but then he was deposed by the Roman government. And when he was deposed, the Roman government put in Caiaphas, which was, I believe, his son-in-law. And he ruled from 18, AD 18 to AD 36. Now, what's interesting about that, you remember at Jesus' trial, he first went to Annas. Annas wasn't the high priest anymore, but he was the one that everybody looked to for the spiritual leader. They didn't believe what Rome had thrown had thrown him down. They didn't believe that Caiaphas was a high priest. But under law, they had to follow it. So he went to Annas first. Anyways, so then we have right there in the middle from 29 to 32 in that range, Jesus in his ministry. But you see, this was a very turbulent time. We're only talking about 40 years give or take, and you have different leaders from all around losing their position, taking positions, and yet right there in the middle is what the timeline we have of Christ. Verse 3, Luke chapter 3, verse 3, John went throughout the entire Jordan region proclaiming a baptism about repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah, he is a voice calling out in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make his paths straight. Now, when it says wilderness, let me tell you, very little is grown in this wilderness. I took that picture on the bottom from the top of Jericho, where Joshua fought the battle of Jericho. Within sight of my own eyes, within sight, you could see this place. It's called Bethabara, and it's called, it means the house of passage. Where John was baptizing, and this is where they believe it is in the top picture. We didn't actually go there. Isn't that beautiful, clear water? Wouldn't you just love to be baptized in that? That's where John baptized. There is nothing out here. I mean, there just really isn't. What's unique about this place is this is the area. Now, the, the scriptures do not specifically tell us where Elijah was taken uh, in the whirlwind, but we know that it was in this area. Now, just for my idea, if God is so perfect in his details, I expect that this is the place where Elijah went up as well, but we know it's the area. But we do know that this is the same place where the children of Israel crossed over the Jordan River into the promised land. This is the area that John the Baptist decided to go to, this house um, of passage, and call them back to repentance. This is where God brought you over the promised land. 
And it's here where we're going to start back before the Messiah shows up. All three of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all quote Isaiah chapter 40, verses 3 through 5, um, speaking of this being uh, John the Baptist coming in as a preparation for the Messiah. What's interesting, though, although all three of them talk about it, you go to the context of Isaiah chapter 40, verses 3 through 5, and that's not really what you get out of it. You get the idea that they're making the path straight so that the people that were taken in taken to Babylon can come home to Israel, and that that's the path that's supposed to be made straight. But apparently... The Holy Spirit said, no, there's more to that passage. There's more to this prophecy than that. And all three of the gospel writers point this passage to John. Verse 5, every valley will be filled. Every mountain and hill will be leveled. The crooked ways will be made straight and the rough roads will be made smooth. Everyone will see, notice that, it says everyone. Guess who everyone is? (laughs) Whosoever meaneth me. That's me. All Gentiles too. Everyone will see the salvation that God has provided. John the Baptist preached repentance and baptism. Repentance is the rejection of your sin and the turning away from it. Baptism was the outward sign that you had repented, that you had turned around from your sin and you weren't going back to it. It didn't save them. They weren't saved by their baptism. But this was done as a result because of their baptism. There's more to deal with that in a minute, and we'll get there. Uh, But what does it mean by every valley filled, the paths that are crooked be made straight, mountains and hills leveled, uh, rough roads smoothed? Well, back in that day, I've, I've questioned this I don't know how many times. I thought, well, that's just an odd statement until I actually studied it for today. I got a new insight. Back then, if the king was coming, he would send messengers, envoys, whatever you want to call them, to say, listen, the king is showing up. So make sure that your roads are fixed to give him an easy ride coming in. And so if the governor found out the king was coming, you made everything ready to go. And one of the things that you did was you went and filled in all the potholes. I guess that's what we need. We just need to bring President Biden out to Oakley Wells on the backside and just have him drive, and maybe Madison County will fix the roads. I don't know. But that's what it's talking about. John the Baptist came in to smooth everything out, to say, listen, we need to be prepared when the king shows up. And how we're prepared is we get rid of the sin that we've been living in. Hmm. Do you think I probably should have said we? I think so. In all honesty, John the Baptist's message is just as relevant back then as it is today. Because when we read what's going on in our nation, we need to be able to be prepared for when the king comes. And how we prepare is repentance. Repentance. All right, well, we'll move on. Verse 7. John the Baptist, by the way, he was miles. I mean, this is literally where we took the picture. It's miles out in the wilderness. People traveled a very long way to hear him, 20 miles on foot uh, to go out there. You can actually see the little white dot when Daniel zoomed it in. But they went a long way. So he must have been preaching some pretty feel-good sermons, don't you think? If they were willing to walk 20 miles to hear him preach, boy, listen to this sermon. I felt a whole lot better about how harsh I am at times after reading his sermon. Maybe this is what I should start preaching. I don't know. Verse 7, John would, would say to the crowds that were coming to be out, of, out to be baptized by him, again, 20 miles on foot, you children of serpents, King James says, you brood of vipers, who warns you to flee the coming wrath? Apparently, he wasn't putting out public notices saying, hey, we're going to have a revival over here at Bethabara. (laughs) No, he didn't publicize it or nothing. He was out there preaching. He had a word, and he was just going to give it. Why are you here? (laughs) Are you coming out to hear about this? Verse 8, 
produce fruit that is consistent with repentance. Do not begin to say to yourselves, we have father Abraham, because I tell you that God could raise up descendants from Abraham from these stones. They thought it was their pedigree that would save them. It was all about their family line. John says, oh no. And then he points over behind him. You're not, remember where we talked about. You remember what Joshua did when they crossed the Jordan River? They got large stones, yeah, for each tribe, one for each tribe. And they went and set it in the river as a remembrance so that any time their family walked by and they looked at those stones in a pile, they'd say, oh, what's that? Well, that's when God brought us across the Jordan. So John says, it's not about your pedigree. It's not about your family of Abraham. And he points back at these stones at what God had already done for the children of Israel. And he says, I could use the DNA that's scratched off of their hands to make a new tribe of Israel. It's not about your pedigree. Verse 9. The axe already lies against the root of the trees. So every tree not producing good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I don't know about you, but Jerry Clower ruined this verse for me. And every time I've ever read this verse since hearing Jerry Clower, I can't think of anything else. So you're going to get his joke. There was a preacher that all he ever did was bat, uh, preach about baptism. Every time he preached, that's all he preached, was baptism, baptism. People got sick of it. And so finally the church came up to him and said, would you please just preach something else? And he says, listen, you give me any scripture and I'll preach that scripture. So they gave him that preacher Luke chapter three, verse nine, and he goes to preach it. So right now the ax is laid to the root of the trees. Why would you lay your ax to the root of the trees? To cut down the tree, to dam up the water so that you could have a baptism. <laughs> Uh, so now back on a serious note, John lets them know that when he shows up, the feller is already there. The lumberjack already is swinging the ax. And when he shows up now, think about this. We're talking 2932 AD. The people that were listening to him, they may have been old people or they may have been young, but in 70 AD, a million just in Jerusalem would die from the war or starvation and plague afterwards. This was happening in their generation. And they missed it. Now, I'm going to get just a little bit political, but this isn't a political problem. So don't take it political. What we have in our nation right now is unsustainable. If we continue down this same path, there is going to be a point at which we can hit the brakes all we want, but the car is still going over the precipice. The bridge is out ahead. And the only opportunity we have is salvation. If God does not save us spiritually, it doesn't matter what happens politically. When, uh, when we were studying on Friday night talking about Ahab, and actually Clarence and I were talking about it, one of the things that shocked me the most was you think about all of those really bad kings in Israel and Judah, and you think like Ahab, one of the worst of them, you know, that it was the decline of Judah and things were in Israel and it was going bad and things were going down. And that's true, but they weren't poor. And they weren't not, they were powerful. In fact, Ahab had one of the largest armies in the region at the time of his leadership. They were strong politically. They were strong financially. They were strong militarily. And the nation was still gone because they had left their God. Folks, John the Baptist's sermon should be preached. I ought to preach it sometime because it's most, it's just as relevant back then as it is today. Our only hope is the salvation of our souls. Verse 10. This is so cool. I love this. 
So the crowds kept asking him, what then should we do? That's a great question. You know how much I would love for the people after a sermon that I preach and they're like, wow, that was really good. I was really convicted. So what do I do with that? That's a good question. Now, John had already given them, you know, produce fruit that's consistent with repentance. But what does that look like? I mean, if we put it down to brass tacks, practical life, what does producing fruit that looks like repentance, what does that look like in our lives? And so he gives them an answer. Verse 11, he answered them and said, the person who has two coats must share with one, share with the one who doesn't have any. And the person who has food must do the same. Even some tax collectors came to be baptized. They asked him, teacher, what should we do? And he told them, stop collecting more money than the amount you are told to collect. They had what they called tax farming back then. Rome, you had an area like that we would have a tax person for Richmond or we'd have a tax person for Urban. You'd go to that person, you'd have to pay your tax. The government would say, we don't care how much you collect, but this is what you are going to owe me at the end of the day. So the tax collectors would charge absorbent amounts, almost what we pay today as a matter of fact. They would pay exorbitant amounts and then they would pocket the rest of it. So John the Baptist says, if you've repented... Don't take more than your fair share. Get paid, sure, but don't cheat anybody. Verse 14. Even some of the soldiers were asking him, what should we do? He told them, never extort money from anyone by threats or blackmail and be satisfied with your pay. That's really, I mean, those are that's some good, good answers. Did you notice anything unique? Who's asking the questions? Soldiers? Who else? Tax collectors. Where's the good religious people? Where's the good Jews? They're not the ones asking the questions. In fact, these people that were asking the questions were either thought of being a Gentile, or they actually were Gentiles because the Jews didn't have soldiers that were controlling them. The ones that are getting saved from John the Baptist's ministry are the Gentiles. They're the ones asking the questions. Now, notice what he says. He doesn't tell them, all right, well, you got to quit your jobs. He said, no, it's not about your pedigree. It's not about your position or your past. This salvation is for you too, Gentiles. To which we say, thank the Lord. Amen. He doesn't tell them to quit their jobs. He doesn't tell them to change their living. He doesn't tell them that they've got to become a priest. He doesn't tell them that they've got to crawl up 500 steps in penance. No. He said, you've repented of your sins. Now live like it. Put it into practice. That's really easy. That's, well, that's not the right word. It's very simple. <laughs> but it's harder to put into practice, isn't it? He says, it's simple. Just live out what you have prayed. And for any more reference to that, I can take you to the entire book of James. <laughs> The one that you have purple toes by the end of reading it, or at least you should. More specifically than just that general idea, he gives three different answers. Verse 11, he says, be generous. If you've got two coats, give to one that doesn't have any. If you have more food and someone doesn't have any, give it to them. Verse 11, be generous. Verse 13, be honest to the tax collectors. And verse 14, to the soldiers, be content. Church, are we being generous? Are we being honest? And are we being content? It's a good way to live. In. I think John the Baptist hit it right on the head. Verse 15. By the way, we're already halfway through. Now the people were filled with expectation. 
And all of them were wondering if John was perhaps the Messiah. John replied to all of them, I'm baptizing you with water, but one is coming who is more powerful than I, and I'm not worthy to untie his sandal straps. It is he who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. He says, I'm not him. He's greater than I am. I'm just the messenger. Verse 17, his winnowing fork is in his hand to clean up the th- his threshing floor. He will gather the grain into his barn and he'll put and he'll burn the chaff with inexhaustible fire. In the next picture, I've got a picture of people winnowing grain. And so what you would do, whether it's in a basket like they have here or it's with a fork, you would set on top of a a saddleback or a hill where the wind would be coming across over top of it. And you would take that grain and you'd toss it up in the air. The grain's heavier and the chaff is light and the wind will catch that chaff and blow it away and then everything else that's heavier will drop down into your pan or onto the floor and then you sweep it up. It's kind of like gold sifting except you do it in the air. It's the same idea. And so what he's saying is when this guy shows up, when the Messiah shows up, Things are going to be turbulent. It's going to get windy. When the chaff hits the ground, he's going to torch it because it's worthless. The wrath of God is coming. And we, whether it's 2,000 years ago or we today, had better be prepared. Verse 18. With many other exhortations, John continued to proclaim the good news to the people. Now Herod the Tetrarch had been rebuked by John because he had married his brother's wife Herodias and because of all of the other evil things Herod had done. Added to this, Herod locked John up in prison. Now this is something that I didn't realize. John the Baptist began his ministry six months-ish before Jesus did in 29 AD. Okay? He ministered for a grand total of one year and Herod threw him in prison for what he was preaching. John lived for two years in prison and then was beheaded because of Herodias. John the Baptist, in all of the greatness of his ministry and how he pointed to Christ, it was a grand total of three years and only one of them was working. The other two were sitting in prison only to be martyred. I did not realize that. Herodias, she was on par with Jezebel. And you read her story, and we will, and I believe it's Luke chapter 9. She was an evil woman. Herod thought she was beautiful and seduced her and stole her from his half-brother Philip, married her, and John the Baptist said, listen, buddy, that's not right. You can't do that. You're the king. Now, granted, Herod was Idumean. He was an Edomite. He wasn't actually Jewish. He was placed by Rome. But regardless, John was going to tell the truth, and Herod didn't like it, so he threw him in jail. Herod was scared of him, but Herodias wasn't. And Herodias convinced her 16-year-old daughter to do a sensual dance before her stepdad to get him to do whatever he she would want him to. So when the king said, I'll give you half my kingdom, she said, all I want is John the Baptist's head on a platter. What 16-year-old would think of that one? Wasn't anybody but Herodias. Verse 21, when all of the people had been baptized, Jesus too was baptized. While he was praying, heaven opened. And the Holy Spirit descended on him and appeared in the form of a dove. Then a voice came from heaven saying, You are my son whom I love. I am well pleased with you. This is the mark of Jesus, the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And what's unique here is you find all three parts of the Trinity in one place, ministering at the same time. Which we know that God is omnipresent, but it's not usually mentioned that they're all three at the same spot. We have God the Father speaking. We have the Holy Spirit descending uh, like a dove. And then, of course, we have Jesus being baptized. There's only three different times written in the Scriptures that God speaks from heaven. There's this one, Matthew chapter 17 at the Transfiguration, and then he is a voice uh, from heaven in John chapter 12. 
The rest of the chapter takes Luke's genealogy. And I'm not reading those names because <laughs> I'll just butcher them. I'll read you a few, but <laughs> please forgive me. This is about as close to verse by verse. I'll have them on the screen for you, okay? Before we get there, though, if you'll please excuse me, I'm going to go just a little bit out of order. When we go to Matthew's genealogy, Matthew starts at Abraham and he works down through Joseph showing the bloodline that Jesus was the legal had a legal right by blood to the throne, okay? But Luke, he takes a different... Well, let me, go, let me go back. We have this line here, and um, Luke and Matthew both, when they go from Abraham to David, the line is exactly the same. But Luke isn't writing about Jesus as the Messiah. He's writing about Jesus as the Son of Man come to earth, God, the son of man. And so he actually takes his genealogy back as far as Adam. Now he works it in reverse. He starts with the son, the stepson, or the, excuse me, the son-in-law and works all the way back through the generations to Adam being, be, being created by God. There's a problem with Matthew's genealogy though. And I want to explain it to you. In Genesis chapter 49, verse 10, the Bible tells us that the Messiah is to be of the royal line and he would be from the tribe of Judah. The Messiah also must be of the line of David, and that's in Ruth chapter 4, verse 22, and 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 11 through 16. But when you look at Matthew's line, that line from David was a train wreck. There's four of them that are stricken. They are literally blotted out of the record because they were so evil. Matthew doesn't even put them in the line. In fact, when you finally go back one day, I'm going to show them. When you finally get down, you find that guy way over there, Jack and I, and I think that's actually his, his son or grandson. But he was so evil that in, Je in Jeremiah 22.30, God made a blood curse on him and said no one would come from his line would be anything. They would never be able to serve. I want to read it for you really quickly. Jeremiah chapter 22, verse 30. One more, Daniel. This is what the Lord says. Write this man off as childless, a man who does not prosper in his lifetime. None of his descendants will succeed in sitting on the throne of David or ever ruling in Judea again. Now, if Matthew's line is the bloodline showing that Jesus has the legal right, the problem is God said, Jeconiah, none of his children are going to sit on this throne. He is considered childless because he was so evil. Man, you know, there's some people that got pretty good smacks from God, but that's, that's a pretty severe one. So how do we reconcile that Jesus would sit on the throne if that bloodline is wiped out? Well, you remember how I said back the first week that you have different aspects of Jesus' life in different views? And so if we only had one of the Gospels, we wouldn't see the full picture? You see a four-dimensional picture of Jesus by getting our four Gospels. And the answer to the question of how does Jesus sit on the throne legally if Jack and I had a blood curse is answered in Luke, in Luke's genealogy. Now we're going to skip down just a little bit. Like I said, from Luke takes it the other way than Matthew does. But here's Luke, verse 32. The son of Jesse, the son of Obed, the son of Boaz, the son of Salmon, the son of Nashon, the son of Aminadab, the son of Admin, the son of Arni, the son of Hezron, the son of Perez, the son of Judah, the son of Jacob, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham. All of those are exactly the same because that's the legal line. That's where it fits. But when you go to the next line... There's a big difference after David. Then you go to that. See all the way in verse 31, because again, we're working backwards on this. Notice what it says. 
the son of Malia, the son of Mena, the son of Madaniah, the son of Nathan. When Matthew did his line, he went David and the son of Bathsheba, Solomon. Well, Solomon's line went down to Jeconiah, and that's the one that was cursed. We can almost, Satan's like, oh, well, God cursed him. Now there can't be anybody sitting on the throne. We've won. And God says, oh, no, I'm not going to use the first son of Bathsheba. I'm going to use the second one, and his name is Nathan. And he is going to be a legal right. But notice, when you go all the way up to verse 23, this is the beginning of the genealogy. And it says, Jesus himself was about 30 years old when he began his ministry. He was legally calculated the son of Joseph, the son of Eli. The wording there, if I can find my notes, I don't know, of course I can't. But anyways, the, the Greek word there is actually, it's not a bloodline. It's the son-in-law. You're like, okay, so why are you saying all this, Dan? How, if it's the son-in-law, does the bloodline work? I love the detail of the scripture. It's perfect. God has everything planned out. You go back to Numbers chapter 27 and you find an obscure law, a very weird law. When they're passing, when Moses is passing out the inheritance, there's a family, there's these daughters of Salophahad who don't have any brothers. And they go up to Moses and they're like, listen, our dad didn't have any sons. And so our family's going to be cut out of the inheritance if we keep this the way it is. So Moses goes back to God and God says, they are right. We need to allow them to be able to marry and have an inheritance so that their family isn't lost. So the law that was made was when these daughters married sons inside the Israel community, the son-in-law became the heir to the family and they would receive the inheritance. And why it's important here is because Luke shows us in that verse 23 that Joseph was the son-in-law of Heli. Heli didn't have any sons, but he had a daughter named Mary. The Luke account is Mary's bloodline that passes from generation to generation and makes it a legal line for Jesus to rule from. So anyways, Matthew gives Joseph's line. Luke gives Mary's line. And I cannot pass this up. I love this passage. Again, um, Luke is giving Jesus as the son of man. And he's taking it all the way back to Adam and God. What better place to give a prophecy about what Jesus would do, the ultimate son of man, than in his genealogy. Luke chapter 3, verse 35, in the genealogy, Luke says this, the son of Sarag, the son of Ru, the son of Peleg, the son of Eber, the son of Shelah, the son of Canaan, the son of Arphaxad, the son of Shem. And then we have names that we know very well, Noah, Lamech, Methuselah, Enoch, Jared, Mahalalel, Canaan, or Kenan, excuse me, Enos, Seth, Adam. We usually just read through those passages and burn through them because they're boring. Why did God have them in there? Well, I've told you over and over again, names, dates, numbers, places, all have meaning. If God wanted it, if it has importance, he put it in the scripture. If it didn't, it was stricken from the record. So when you take the meaning of these men's names in order, it gives you the plan of salvation. And again, you can do this on your own. You get your concordance, Thompson chain. You look up what each man's name means, and it gives you the word. And when you put it in order, it's the perfect plan of salvation. For example.
Adam means man. That's what the scripture tells us. Seth means appointed. In Genesis chapter 4, verse 25, explains that. Enosh meant mortal, frail, or miserable. <laughs> what a name. Kenan was sorrow. It was an allergy or a dirge. Mahalalel is a mouthful, but it means the blessed God or the praised God. Mahalal is blessed and El is God. Jared means his name shall come. Enoch means teaching or commencement. Methuselah means his death shall bring. Lamech is the same word that we have today, lamentations. Same word. Means despairing. Lament. And Noah, Genesis chapter 5, verse 29, confirms that his name means comfort or rest. So when you put these in the, gener in the genealogical order for ten, ver 10 in a row, this is what it says. Man is appointed mor mortal sorrow, but the blessed God shall come down teaching his death shall bring despairing comfort or rest. What Jewish rabbi is going to put that <laughs> all the way back in Genesis? Kind of hide it. Ain't going to happen. And it's too coincidental. It just wraps up way too nicely to just be by chance. All the way back in Genesis, God had a plan. In fact, the scriptures tells us before the foundations of the world, there was a deal struck between Jesus and the Father where Jesus would be the sacrificial lamb for you and I. I want to take us back in closing very quickly to verse 16 and 17. When they were asking him if he was the Messiah, John said to them, I baptize you with water, but one is coming who is more powerful than I, and I'm not worthy to untie his sandal straps. It is he who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clean up the threshing floor. He will gather the grain into his barn, but he will burn the chaff with inexhaustible fire. He says, no, I am not the Messiah. I simply baptize with water. He baptizes with fire. Now, we often take the mistaken impression that it's all about getting people saved. It's all about getting people to an altar, getting them to pray some kind of sinner's prayer, or to walk them through the Roman road and then get them to say a prayer at the end so that they get their fire insurance. And then we kind of leave the baby at the doorstep and just walk away. But it's much more than that. In fact, if you take what John the Baptist is saying here, after you repent and are baptized with water, it's not that you get to avoid the fire. <laughs> no, as a matter of fact, you get thrown into the fire. Now, it's a different fire, fortunately. <laughs> it's God's refining fire. It's not his destroying wrath fire. But the idea here is, John is saying, listen... There's more to this than just repent and be baptized. You get your fire insurance and you're good. This is a daily walk. Jesus said, I am the way. It's not the, I am the doorstop. <laughs> it's not that we just simply come in. We get what we need and we're fine. It's not it. This is a daily walk. Now, we have to think about this too from John's perspective. John the Baptist was the last Old Testament prophet. When he died, that was it. So when he preached, he preached hellfire and brimstone. He preached like the prophets of old. He preached like Elijah. Even preached where Elijah went up in that area. This was his thinking. So with that in mind, when you think about washing by water and purifying by fire, what do you think of? You got to think of the Old Testament now. Yeah, you're both right. The tabernacle and the sacrifices. If you were going to use a utensil 
to be in the tabernacle or the temple, it had to be, it had to have two trips. <laughs> the first one, it had to be gone, it had to be washed with water. And if it could go through the fire, then it would be gone, it would be put through the fire. The first one was to wash all the filth off because nobody wants to use a filthy cup. The second one was to do something much deeper than just washing. It was purifying. And it was put through the fire if it could be. And everything that didn't belong there that didn't make it pure was burnt off. Like I said, we get the idea that we have a, a baptism of salvation and a baptism of sanctification and the filling of the Holy Spirit. And then we're done. But John the Baptist is teaching something majorly different that we often miss. He's talking about us being used as vessels for God. If we are not washed, if we are not purified, we are useless to him. And so what John the Baptist is saying, I'm just washing with water. <laughs> I'm getting the filth off. But when he shows up, he's going to burn the dross off too. Remember verse 17, he said, his winnowing fork is in his hand and to clean the threshing floor, he will gather the grain into the barn. He's going to keep what's good and he's going to burn the rest with unquenchable fire. That's what happens when the Holy Spirit shows up. And we're going to talk about a lot more of that on, on this coming Sunday because it's Pentecost Sunday. But this is the idea that when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, He starts shaking things up in your life and saying, okay, that doesn't look like me. It's time to go. And one of these days, He's going to complete that work. <laughs> but it takes... The repentance first and being baptized, coming into the Spirit. And then it also takes the infilling of the Holy Spirit that came on Pentecost to burn the dross from our lives that we can be vessels properly used for his kingdom. Does that make sense? Do you see the difference? So here's the question then, which you probably expect me to already ask. Are you a fit vessel to be used by God? Are you listening to his whole... Well, first of all, have you repented of the sins you've been living in? Have you not just felt bad for them? Have you felt bad enough that you were willing to turn around and walk away from them? Have you made witness of that, whether it be by baptism or inside a church? Amongst your family? Have you turned so much that everybody recognizes that you're different? And then further than that, have you allowed the Holy Spirit when He has filled you to use you how He may? Have you allowed His will to be now your will? Or have you quenched His Spirit's voice by doing it your way? We are to be vessels for His use. Not one and done not getting the, the word done, not coming and having a relation or a, a, a reaction to a sermon. None of that. This is a walk. This is priest gets up in the morning and he goes and he decides which cup to use and oh, please use me today. And the next morning you get up and the priest comes to pick out the cup to use. Oh, please use me today. That only happens if we allow the Holy Spirit to be first and foremost king in our life. And that's what the filling of the Holy Spirit is all about. Well, let's pray. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for watching. It really does mean the world to me that you're getting a blessing out of it. If this video was a blessing, make sure to hit that thumbs up button for me. That way other people can find it as well. Here in the link section, you'll find playlists and new videos that we put out. We try to do two or three a week. You can also subscribe to the channel. Uh, by pressing on my face and then hitting the bell icon and that will alert you to new videos. May God richly bless you.